वासुवती भट्टाचार्य a very warm welcome to all of you good evening uh, today uh, on behalf of center for spiritualism and human enrichment we are and school of management sciences we are conducting another uh, high life lecture series today we have amongst us uh, dr basuti bhattacharya uh, who is an authority in the field of ayurveda and of course uh, a senior fulbright fellow uh i would like to first call upon um mr kamal shil mishra sir dean of computer science to welcome our guest with a bouquet this much now i'd like to call upon uh, mr kk bajpayee ji to come and introduce dr bhattacharya to all of us hello well it's not very easy to introduce dr bhashwati bhattacharya as a, she is a polymath now polymath is a word i just discovered a while ago a polymath is a person who is adept and expert in many fields she is a doctor and with her from harvard university after doing her medicine and md and uh, then she moved into ayurveda and there she is expert she runs an organization called uh, which has dincharya there's so many things it's uh, really flabbergasting eight page of cv that i that even a paragraph would get somebody a job and uh, i don't know why she has that a page just go through it so it's very difficult for me to read and um, even tell what she is i cannot begin to tell you and yes she is a wonderful woman and uh, she is uh, yes she made all of us proud in more than one ways throughout her life when she started um, uh, well to a small thing which which you can see on youtube um, she is the first female non white to address at harvard the graduation <coughs> commencement you call it na no? that lecture so that is there on youtube and it's a beautiful piece of uh, speech i think all of us should listen to it discovery uh, discovery has made a documentary on her and so that's healer she is so there are so many things i think i am not competent enough to tell anything about her so i would rather i don't know who uh, who is supposed to ask should i to call or you uh, take over because i am just <laughs> yeah yeah of course yes the one experience i need to tell about about her see i had injured everybody knows it i'm uh, like this for some time and uh, i know her through a friend of mine who is a friend of another friend of mine and uh, that person happened to be here at the campus his name is babu swarvaniam he is a hollywood filmmaker and he is actually a friend of uh, mr mahesh bhat so when uh, babu was coming to varanasi mahesh bhat called me he said a friend of his is coming to varanasi and to meet his friend so i said all right i'll see him and uh, see that he meets his friend all right so i just took him along with me and uh, went to bhu and i saw her for the first time and that that was about it and i was just taking them around city and different places and, and we have a saying that to sarna to sanyasi wala jo so one uh, one of some such entity called sarn that gentleman hit me out here somehow and i was in pain i was just excruciating pain i had because it was uh, fresh only at that time she saw it see she's a doctor so she saw it that i was in pain though i tried my best to hide it <coughs> and uh, see as a as a host i was sitting in the front seat next to the driver and these two guests were sitting on the back seat but she insisted and had her way and she asked me to sit in the back and babu was sitting in the front seat and she just sat next to me and she just felt it here and uh, she mentioned some i i don't remember what she said but she said she mentioned this is a fracture which is out here 
And I, all the time I felt because I felt the fracture was here. She said, no, it is here and she named something. So I really doubted it at that time. I, I told myself that I'll go home and see it. Anyway, so she, she said, you're not healing properly and uh, it, it, um, it's not yet healed. But let me do something and I'll put my hand here and you'll feel cold. Now that was surprising because generally what we experience when two human beings touch each other, living human beings touch each other, it's rather warm, it's never cold. But after a while I started feeling cold in this area and uh, stayed there for about good 30 minutes, 30-40 minutes and uh, the pain was relieved and that was the first time I slept because since the time I was injured, injured, uh, fractured my hand, I could never sleep. I used to recline having pillows on my bed because every time I used to sleep there was some lot of pain, excruciating pain in the night. So that was the first time I slept. So that was kind of magical miracle. I don't know what she did. But of course that was not some Kala or something. It must be some hidden form of Indian medicine. Medicine which is called Ayurveda. Which she is working. She's working on a topic called Ojas. And she'll maybe if she finds it appropriate, she'll tell us more about it. So that was my experience and I was really amazed at this and I'm really grateful to her for healing me. Yes, I'm healed pretty much now. You can see it. I'm keeping my hand here. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now I, will call, I would like to request our Honorable Director Sir, uh, Dr. P. N. Sir, to please come on stage and mm -hmm. say a few words. You can speak about anything. Yes. We can accommodate management. It's highly accommodated. If you like, I can accommodate and you can insist on something. Our today's guest, Dr. Aswati Hattacharya, who is a Fulbright Nehru scholar, a visiting professor, a senior research scholar, and faculty of Ayurveda, BHU, and my <coughs> dear colleagues. As you know, that we have been organizing High Life Lecture Series here under the aegis of our CC. Center for Spiritualism and Human Enrichment, where from we used to derive diverse arrays of knowledge for us. And it is highly collaborative towards our aim and mission. Today, very fortunately, we have among us Dr. Bhattacharya, Madam. I take the opportunity to extend a very warm welcome to you to School of Management Sciences. As you might be knowing by now that this institution is now 19 years old and uh, basically we have been imparting the Management and Computer Sciences programs here at PG and UG level. We have got a very good strength of talented faculty members. That is our main strength. And uh, because primarily we deal in management education, so like management education, we by our very nature, we are highly accommodative. Because in our management, we see that there are plural cognitive corridors and we used to welcome any kind of idea, any kind of information because the more rich would be the pool of information, our knowledge, the better would be the ambience under which we can take decision or we can share this information with our students. That's why whatever area you like, whether it is your Ayurveda or whether it is the production regarding the betel nut, 
whatever you like. You can give us some new insights in the area, it will be highly helpful. I also extend my sincere thankfulness to Mr. Bajpay, who has given us this opportunity that we could meet Dr. Bhattacharya. Once again, I welcome you, madam, and seek something very original from you. Thank you very much. Uh, it gives me uh, immense pleasure, privilege and honor to call on Dias uh, Dr. Mahashwati Bhattacharya. Uh, before I just call her up, I would like to say one thing because uh, we, me being a part of Centre for Spiritualism and Human Enrichment, uh, we have come across many wisdom traditions, many traditions which exist in India. And uh, Ayurveda is certainly one of them. And there are two names which normally comes to mind when we talk of Ayurveda. One is Robert Svoboda, and uh, the second one is uh, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya. And uh, I'm really delighted to know that she's going to speak something on Ojas, because <laughs> I thought maybe she has come over here and probably she would again redefine a tradition that she always wants to do. Uh, so without wasting any more time, I would like to call upon uh, Dr. Bhattacharya because she has not just uh, made our India proud, but probably she has made many women in India proud by giving that Harvard commencement speech in the year 1993. So without wasting any more time, I would like to welcome Dr. Bhattacharya. How much time should I speak? Let's see what you guys can tolerate. <laughs> Actually, uh, I have an institute in New York called the Dhinacharya Institute, and we teach health professionals, mostly physicians, medical students, and nurses, but also some physical therapists, yoga teachers. Um, other people in the health professions, we teach them Ayurveda. And the classes, because they have work Monday through Friday in the US, in New York, we teach Saturday and Sunday, 8 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And when I take the modules, I start at 7.45, the students start coming early, and uh, usually we have a ritual, I teach them how to make chai, or some kind of something you know, that Americans would like to know. And my chai is actually very good, so I, I like to make for my students. And then at 8 o'clock prompt, we start. And I have to speak from 8 o'clock straight until 1.30. And we have one hour lunch where the students will not let me. They ask all their questions during that time. And then from 2.30 until 6. So I won't uh, make you sit here and listen to me for 10 hours, but I can actually go for 10 hours straight and then take a small break overnight and go again Sunday 8 to 6. And that I'm accustomed to doing uh, regularly. And we talk Ayurveda. And that format is um, 10 weekends over the course of a year. It's one weekend per month. And so it's 20 hours of work. Uh, with one or two hours um, during the week, we have a conference call on the telephone. And through that, I teach them the complete information on Ayurveda that they need in order to practice Ayurveda within that 200 hours or so. And uh, it's a model that's been used quite a bit around the world and is now, um, it's actually flourishing quite a bit now. And I like it because um, it defies, uh, as you get to know me, you'll see, I like to defy what people say is possible. You know, the only way to know the limits of what is possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. So as long as I keep going and pushing the envelope, you know, let them say it's impossible, I will, I will keep going. So this kind of a challenge for me, I'm a little bit of a JD, JD means a stubborn, um, uh, I, I would like to say I'm an innovator because I really want to see 
solutions to things which are not possible. So Dinacharya Institute is teaching people where in India they say you have to go to school for five and a half years and do a BAMS course and it's six days per week and it's and I see what the BAMS students can do. And certainly they can do certain things that my students can't do, but my students are practicing and they're doing quite well. So it's it's quite a, a nice thing for me to have that as a model. Um, I am an entrepreneur, actually. I didn't realize that until Thai, the Indus entrepreneurs, invited me to their uh, convention this year and had me speak on entrepreneurship in Ayurveda. And uh, it was quite a fun talk. I talked about ideas that I have for promoting Ayurveda where people who are interested in Ayurveda could start their own uh, companies as entrepreneurs. And it was the first time that at the end of the lecture, the audience like came toward me in like a wave. And I was there for two hours answering questions for the different people. And um, you know, I, I realized that I'm not just a doctor, and I'm not just a professor, and, and I'm not just a various other things that I do. Um, I, I also am an entrepreneur. And I like the fact that I can um, create new solutions. And I think that's what all of you are doing. And that's what you're interested in doing. So I've been asked to speak about a few different things, so I'm going to make a small list here. And uh, if there are any urgent and burning things that you would like to add to the list, I would be happy to uh, address them maybe um, in the question and answers. I will talk about OGIS, because you had asked about that, and a little bit about Ayurveda, and a little bit about the Fulbright program, because uh, Mr. Bajpai had asked for that. And because I'm here for um, Sishi, I would like to talk uh, the main part of the time about how to enrich yourselves, as I've learned. So my life story is, um, uh, I don't wish it on anyone. I think it's a very difficult life story, but uh, it's brought me to where I am now. So if I ever feel any regrets for what I've gone through, um, people think that I've had it very easy because what they see is very polished. And certainly you should always be polished, right? You should, your hair should always be combed, your clothes should be clean, your shoes should be shined, you should have good accessories on, people should see you nicely. But behind that is a lot of stuff that's happened. And I know that I would not be here unless I had failed many times. So um, I had to learn that failure is actually just an opportunity, and I hope that you guys have all learned that so far. I, I think that's business 101. Um, my mother says that the reason that I can appreciate 100 is because I've seen zero. And once you've seen zero, I'm not saying that you should go and hunt out zero, okay? But if you do fail and you get down to just zero, where you have nothing, then from there you can really come up. And I've seen some of my favorite friends who are Kuropathis, who just lost everything, and they just went to zero. They made some huge mistake, or the market turned, or something happened, and they, they just turned it around. So how do you do that? The core of how to do that is not on the outside. It's not on learning the stock market better, or on learning how to manipulate your employees better, um, it's not on you know the politics and managing the politics that's in every institution, whether it's a corporation or an academic or a non-profit place. It really comes from the fact um, that many traditions talk about that power comes from here. And we don't spend a lot of time talking about our inner, uh, our inner power. As Indians, if you grew up in a family that taught you about uh, inner power, yes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I grew up as a Bengali Brahmin. My father and mother, I won't say that they uh, evangelized it, but they lived it. They lived it and they taught it to us. And we grew up knowing that all the money and the connections and the um, external materialism, it's all there for a purpose. It's there because people who are less secure about themselves will judge you. And they will judge you in a way that, uh, you know, they'll make their first impressions. Oh, he's wearing that kind of uh, shirt. That must mean he's poor. Oh, he's wearing that kind of shirt. That must mean he's successful. Those kind of impressions are there. And I think all of you know that um, the dress to impress is, is there. And we do it. I do it. Uh, I know about it. Uh, one of my <clears throat> only role models is Hillary Clinton. I worked with her for some years. 
and she gave a speech called Hair. And she said that in the beginning, when she was first the wife of the governor, she used to change her hairstyle a lot. Just because she wanted to. She's a woman, she would tie her hair some days and leave it down and haircuts. She said it made her appear very unpredictable. And people couldn't quite read her. And she learned that to wear her hair the same way was very important. This is a speech actually, I suppose, you can probably find it on YouTube. It's a very good speech to listen to. And just put in Hillary Clinton, I think this was a speech at University of Pennsylvania on hair. So she talked about dressing properly and dressing to impress. So we have that on the outside. I'm not going to deny that that's important. But beyond that is what's on the inside. And I think there are a lot of people that don't spend time developing that. One of the reasons is because they don't know where to start. So as I've moved from modern medicine through public health, I also have a degree in pharmacology. I did my PhD work in pharmacology and neuroscience back before my uh, medical days. And as a scientist, I saw there were people with huge brains, huge laboratory um, technical skills, but they didn't know who they were inside. Many of them were lost, they were slaves to their emotions, they drank a lot of alcohol, they smoked cigarettes, they didn't have good impulse control, they had a lot of anger management issues, and yet they were brilliant, so everyone excused their behavior. And I moved from that into public health, where people were very status conscious, very money-mongering, um, and very um, fluffy, as we call it. Fluffy means they didn't have a lot of brain skills. And then I moved into modern medicine where people were very competitive. Now they all have qualities, but they seem to lack something. Um, and somewhere I, I was asked to do a film uh, that Mr. Vajpayee mentioned was on the Discovery Channel. And there I learned about Ayurveda. And they immediately thought that of course I should be an expert in Ayurveda because I'm Indian and in the USA. You know, and for me it was a, actually, to be honest, it was a free trip to India to see Canada for six weeks and see some clinical cases. So I said, sure, why not? I was a full allopath at that time. And I came and I, I saw things with my own eyes that I had never seen before. And that began the journey for me towards Ayurveda, which I'm fully immersed in now. Uh, I've actually been given, a, not given, I've earned uh, admission to the PhD program in uh, Ayurveda at BHU. So once I finish my full brain, I'll go and get off the diplomatic visa and um, become a civilian and get a student visa and then come back and do my PhD in Benares for the next five years. So I'm going to really uh, live Ayurveda, um, I think, for the rest of my life. And one of the reasons is because it's the only field that I have found where people are actively not only encouraged, but demanded to have inner power as part of their strength. Now, why is Ayurveda such a mess if there's so much inner power? Uh, it's because people are struggling to learn how to get that inner power strong within themselves. And it's a journey. It's a journey for people. But what I found is that those who are able to take those steps and move forward, and I'll, I'll go through some of those steps, they are the ones that achieve that level of vitality and strength on the inside that translates to being able to do things on the outside. Um, to be able to be vulnerable and completely open and human and not have a fortress around you, but yet to be very strong. How does one do that? How do you keep yourself so you are not vulnerable to attacks by people on the outside, whoever they are? They may be your boss, they may be a colleague that's competitive with you, they may be your underling, they may be your secretary who's a spy or something, you know, for another person. Or it could be another institution. How do you keep yourself strong and yet vulnerable? And uh, what I point to is keeping your spine strong and keeping your mind strong. So, of course, I have a neuroscience background, so I like, I like that, um, that analogy. But what I start out with is knowing yourself on the inside through meditation. It's so simple. You know, most of the lessons, if you read these management books that, you know, you can just read in the airport, in the bookshop while you're waiting for your flight, you can read them in two hours. Um, they tell you very, very simple lessons. They're simple but not easy because they require us to condition our behaviors differently. And sometimes society doesn't want us to condition ourselves differently, right? If you go out every evening with the boys for drinks, it's 
hard to say, no, I'm not going to drink tonight. Or if you're um, used to getting up with your spouse at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's hard to say, darling, I'm going to wake up at 4.30 and have you know, three and a half extra hours. There's a lot of pressure on us from our families to not change our routines. But to change your routine so that you can be strong from your core is the key. Ayurveda talks about a word which means daily routine. Daily is din, acharya is, uh, it's actually charya, routine. And that's actually the name of my institute in, in the US. Daily routine has uh, 42 prescriptions that Ayurveda proposed that if you do those systematically, 1 to 42 every day, you will actually gather that strength within yourself. To learn how to do that is um, a chore. And I had been learning about it, but I'm not actually doing it to myself for many years. And then I just decided, what's preventing me? Let me start. And with my sample size of one, and now actually many patients and students, I can say that I don't understand exactly why, but just blindly surrendering to those that wisdom of the Shastras and doing those step by step, will make you stronger. So in there is folded many of those simple lessons that are not easy to do, but they're important. And I divide them up into five areas. One is the early morning routine, waking up. Second is cleaning your senses, what are called jamantriyas, your five uh, senses, which is your hearing, your seeing, your smelling, your tasting, and your touching. Um, the third is learning how to take a bath and taking a bath properly. The fourth is what we call life in the real world, not in your home. And the fifth is a good evening routine. And within each of those five sections are simple routines. How many of you do some of those routines? Do you, do you know anyone? Do them? One, two people? Actually, all of you do them. All of you, either because of your nani, your masi, your ma, your someone, your papa, someone has taught you how to do these. So, when you wake up in the morning, you should wake up in Brahma Muhutta. I'll just go through the first section, okay? Brahma Muhutta. Why? Because the early part of the morning, 4.35 o'clock, it's when your hormone levels are actually keyed in to, um, I call it prime time with the gods. It's when your vata, your, your air space is the most clean. If you ever wake up that early, you'll know it's a very clean time of the morning. And if you can wake up at that time, depending on your body constitution, whether you're a vata person, a pitta person, or a kapha person, or a combination thereof, you should either go for a walk, or you should sit down and study, or you should sit and meditate, or you should go for prayer, depending on the season of the year, and the body type, and maybe, maybe some illness that you have. You just adjust your activities. But all of them focus on bringing down that aberrant flow of energy in your mind, which is that chanchal tendency that we all can have. And bring that down to a place of stillness, what we call sthira. And if you could find a sthan, which is the place, a place where you feel safe, where you can let go of your physical body because you're in a safe space, and find that sthir, then you will find a stillness which many people actually don't experience. I mean, when I think about it, 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 I have to remind myself that there are people that never feel this every day. I feel at least several times a day. And I just, if I'm ever off center, I just come back to that space for a few moments and then I restart again. Many people never do that. They spend the entire day chanchal. Steve Jobs, who is the, was the founder of Apple, is the founder of Apple, was living, um, he said that idle time, where you're not bound to anything time-oriented or space-oriented, is the time of creativity. It's the time where I, ideas and solutions spring up from the wells and the depths of who you are and come into your consciousness. Without that idle time, you cannot have the level of creativity that you would have. And he says it's very important to have idle time. That's why sports are very important. It's why morning walks are important. It's why being in nature is important to just have that idle time. If you're goal-oriented, I'm going to be in nature. I'm going to spend five minutes in nature. I'm going to go walking through the garden. And then in five minutes, I'm going to do this. And while I'm doing the five minutes, I'm going to be on my Bluetooth and checking my emails and doing this and this. That is 
Well, that is not idle time. I think you all know what idle time is. And there are many management experts who have been interviewed who say, you know, my best ideas came when I'm in the shower, sitting with my grandchildren, just playing, <coughs> when I'm on the golf course, uh, when I'm playing cricket, various um, idle activities. After spending that morning time in Brahma, waking up Brahma Mahutta, we should not move. We should actually sit still or lay still. You're usually lying down. And just examine your gut and figure out, did I eat yesterday and digest my food or not? Because the food is the source of your uh, energy and your strength. Ayurveda says very clearly that 80% of your diseases that happen, the imbalances that happen, come from your mind and your gut. If your gut is not settled well, and your mind is not settled well, you will get sick. Huh. So there's a, a, I think some of you know Sanskrit. It says, Raga di roga, shapatana shaktana she shakaya, prashatana sheshan, otsukya moha, ratidan jaghana, yopurva vaidyaya, namastutasme. It's saying these mental, emotional, um, uh, imbalances or or chancha kind of feelings, these emotions that we don't have control of, they are the beginnings of everything that becomes imbalanced in us. And you can see that if you're about to eat and you don't have a mind that's still or someone just calls on the phone and says something very disturbing, your appetite goes away or you have butterflies or you have a sense of unwellness and then you try to eat that same meal and you can't eat it. That's the beginnings of disease. So Ayurveda says, don't do that. Learn to be more conscious of it. Learn to be in communication with your gut. And the place to start that is in the morning. So you wake up early, you listen to your gut, and you just say, okay, how is it? Did I eat properly yesterday? Am I feeling full? Am I feeling hungry? Am I famished and I have to get up right now? Do I feel gassy? Do I feel like I have to go to the bathroom? Do I feel uneasy? What do I feel? Some of you with acidity will start feeling the acidity in your throat. Some of you will have a lot of distension. Some of you can't feel anything because it's so quiet. That's fine. And once that happens and you've gotten a sense of it, then you reach down to the ground before you um, touch the floor with your feet because you're going to walk over Ma Prithivi all day and just stomp on her back all day. You first touch the ground and you thank her for what is coming in the steps of your path of life before you start the day. This seems very, very religious. So some people say, oh, I don't believe in religion. But actually what you're also doing when you reach down is you're compressing your body from shoulder to knees and you're actually moving the peristalsis down towards your, your gut. So you're getting your gut contents to move downwards since you've been lying down like this once you sit up. And that is going to give you, uh, hopefully, what's called the gastrocolic reflex, which is where your gut will start pushing things downwards. And for most people, you can check this on yourself, for normal people, within 10 to 15 minutes of waking up, you should feel the urge to go to the bathroom, which you didn't feel while you were lying down. If you stay lying down, the urge won't come. But as soon as you sit up, it will come. So then you should go to the bathroom. And the rest of the morning chores are in the bathroom. So you. You do what's called morning ablutions, which means you empty your bowels and your bladder. You wash your hands, which I would hope that everyone's learned to do, but having gone to the ladies' room in the public toilets, I can tell you many women will come out of the stall and they never wash their hands and they just walk out of the bathroom. So, and men do it too. There's been many uh, reports that tell that men don't wash their hands. You have to wash your hands for hygiene purposes. I really teaches these small things which seem so silly but are so important and they're a main part of public health. It just weaves public health right into the day. Then you wash your face, you wash your eyes with cold water, especially for business types. You want to wash your eyes. Why? Because heat comes out of your eyes. What we call as alochaka pitta comes out of your eyes. So if your eyes are not able to see properly, then where will your 
perception, and certainly we, we look at our visual perception as being so important. So you really want to do that. And many of you have dry eyes because you spent 10 hours in front of the computer. You can put ghee on your eyes at night. Just take some ghee, keep it in a separate jar, a glass jar, and just apply it on your eyes and blink until everything is blurry. If you do that, I recommend that to a lot of my management types that have that Bloomberg screen, you know, on one side and the computer screen on the other side, and they've got screens all day and they're uh, working at the computer at least 10, 12 hours a day. And then, that's not even counting their iPads, their Bluetooth, their, sorry, their uh, Blackberry, their iPhone. And so they're always, their eyes are always moving. So I tell them to take key, which is cooling at night, and then in the morning clean with cold water and just uh, wash the eyes. And then I put water in the nose and, and uh, uh, just send it out. Um, and that gets rid of any kind of mucus. It also humidifies the nose, especially in this weather. Every morning you should be doing that. It will also coat the nose with a nice coating. Is this too medical for you? No. Are you enjoying this? Okay, because I don't think you hear about these things usually. Um, and then you swish in your mouth, and then you take toothpaste, which in this season should be bitter, because this is the kapha, this is the heavy watery season. In the summer, which is very hot, it should be sweet. So we have three different seasons, vata, pitta, and kapha, we should have three different types of toothpastes. That's what Ayurveda says. And then you brush your teeth, then you scrape your tongue. How many of you scrape your tongue? Okay, a few of you. All of you should scrape your tongue because your taste buds are covered with muck. And if you can just uncover them by scraping them, not brushing, not moving the dirt from one side to the other, but brushing uh, only does that. If you scrape it, you will uncover those taste buds. And the taste buds, when they are open will actually help you to taste better and you will actually eat less food and you'll be more choosy about your food. So if you have a tendency to eat food that is not inside the home, so you don't know what the quality is going to be, and you're not tasting it, you can get sick. But if your taste buds are there, they will warn you, don't eat this. It's too acidic. That means it could be rotten, right? It could be old. Or don't eat this, it's too uh, mirch. Or don't eat this, it's too sweet. And most of us, what we'll do is we'll just eat, we'll keep talking to our friends, we're standing, we don't even sit down to eat, and we're just shoveling it in. It doesn't taste good, but we just want to finish the plate. Don't waste food, so we just keep eating. I would say don't do that. So in the morning, clean your taste buds so that they're more awake and they are going to tell you what, what to do. Then you swish your mouth again. And there's all kinds of routines in there that are specific for individual patients and what they and your need, like if you have pain in your jaw, which is called temporomandibular joint pain, which is very common in management people because they're always going like this. They're clenching their teeth. Um, there's no cure for it in modern medicine, but Ayurveda says you take til tel, which is sesame oil, you take a mouthful of it, and you just swish. And what it will do is the oil will go into the micro pores on the sides, and they will go um, and coat the nerves, which are inside the maxillary and mandibular nerves, which are inside of here. And they will um, make that pain, they will lessen the pain, and they will s slowly cure it. And I've had people that have this pain who do this, it's called gandusha, with tiltel, and in two weeks their temporomandibular pain is gone. And you can see it because people who do this, their faces are lopsided because they clench, so they're like, you can, you know, have you seen people with lopsided faces? Go and watch and see if a person's face is symmetric. And if you see this, like this, or like this, it's because they have some kind of asymmetry going on. So if you've learned NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming, all of you should learn this, by the way. It's a nice course. You get to see what people's facial expressions mean. If you've read this book by Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Outliers, the, I think it's the second to last chapter, he talks about facial expressions. It's worth it to read that chapter. I'm sure you have that book in your library here. So you should, you should just read it. So you can read people's facial expression and tell a lot about whether they're lying or whether they're, you know, what they're thinking. Uh, so Ayurveda says you just swish and you get rid of that, that uh, asymmetry. Then you finish that and you go and you take a glass of water. Okay. After that, you just make sure you listen to something auspicious so the ear is cleansed with good sound.
So it can be a mantra, it can be some nice clean music. I'm not talking about rock and roll or rap, I'm talking about something very nice. Here, one of the things I love about Benar, six o'clock, I have the Gayatri Shakti beat right near my house. I hear shank, I hear mantras, I hear pujas going on every morning at 6 a.m. So I get that sound in my ear every morning. Um, then you should look at something auspicious. So you should have either an altar or a picture of someone or something that's auspicious. It can be your, your relatives, your ancestors, or it can be some figure of someone. And you should look at yourself in the mirror and see how you present yourself to the world. So these are the early morning routine. There's just about 15 things in there. It's not impossible to do. And if you were listening to me throughout, you would say, yeah, probably, yeah, I do probably eight or 10 of those things already. So each of you is doing some level of dinacharya. If you can do them in the order that I said, and do them every day, you will find that something will shift. And I can't tell you the magic of why. But something happens where you start out the day and you're doing some level of order uh, that your body needs, of cleaning those indriyas, those senses. And it will bring for you a level of togetherness. After that, uh, depending on your day, you should sit for meditation. So my biggest lesson uh, and teaching to my students is to do a daily practice of meditation every day. It doesn't mean once a week you store up and then on Sunday you do it seven times. It means every day. And it can be 10 minutes. It doesn't have to be, you know, a, a sadhu's two hours of sitting and reciting the entire whatever, Hanuman Chalisa or whatever. You can just do 10 minutes. Just sit. And if you can't do that, and you say, my mind is too chancha, which in America is very common. I'm in New York, which is the management capital, right? And uh, everyone's busy, and they start out in the morning. They've got 30 messages from the night before from Tokyo all the way to London. It's been you know, giving them messages. So what I do is I tell them, don't open your phone right away. Pretend you're still sleeping, OK? So no one can get to you. And take those 10 minutes and just sit quietly, light a candle, and just stare into the candle. And any time any thought comes, pour the thought into the candle. And just pour it in. And just trust that anything you need to remember, you'll remember. If you're really, really freaky and like completely um, anxious, then you might keep a notepad and write down those important things that you forgot. But otherwise, you just pour your thoughts into the candle. And after 10 minutes, you'll see that your mind first few days might not have any change, but after a while, you'll see that some changes start happening. It's a very simple thing to do, but if you do it, that meditation practice will shift you, and you'll spend, instead of all day being chancha like this, you'll have 10 minutes of the day where you're completely still, and then the chancha happens. And then after some time, there'll be more time, and then the chancha will happen, and then the more time, you'll have still, and as the day goes through, you'll find yourself still, even though the chanchal is happening on the world around you, you'll still be um, quite cool. This is such a simple lesson, it's almost ridiculous that I'm spending the time here uh, talking about it. At the same time, until you're doing it and mastering it, you have to hear it again and again. And once you've heard it and it's really in, like it's really in and you're doing it, a different level of understanding will come, and then you will just you'll shift. I can't explain why that shift happens like that, but it's very, very important. Um, in addition to that, there are a few other things. Uh, I took a class on Wall Street. I used to work at Citibank um, on Wall Street uh, in my management days, and um, they had a course called the Cycles of Abundance. And so I learned some of the lessons of how to create abundance. So I just decided, you know, abundance is good. Having a few extra resources is good. Um, we need to get over our fear of money. Rather than coveting it, we need to have it in our lives and let it go. How to do that? So this man taught this course, and um, one of them was to clean some corner of your house. So if you go home tonight, you just take one small drawer or one shelf. I'm not saying you're full almari, but just one small place. You take everything out, you clean, you, you, know, you wipe it down, clean the paper off and you get fresh paper there. And then you just put everything back. Anything that's broken, you set aside that you're going to send to fix. Anything that doesn't belong to you, you 
get back to who you would need to return it to, and anything that's not at all used or usable, you give away. Everything you need or want, you just put back in, and everything is orderly. You do that every day for seven days, I can almost guarantee you that some kind of abundance will come into your life. And I've always wondered why. So one expert told me um, that what happens is you have latent static energy between those things that are just sitting in your cupboard or your drawer. If you just take them out and you release that static energy and you get flow moving back into your life, then the flow, the universe is always trying to give you abundance. It's constantly trying. The problem is you're sitting here with your hands like this or like this. Most of us do not sit like this, ready to receive. When you clean a little part of something in your home or your office, you open up the space. Now, even if everything you put back in takes up most of the space, there's some space there and the energy is clean now. So that was one lesson he gave. Um, another lesson was to do affirmations. Affirmations are present tense uh, statements that you say, and you proceed them with either a mantra or uh, you can even do just OM. So if you really want something, then you just say that every day. I, and you don't say I want, you say I am running this company. Hmm? I am running, uh, I am the next director of this company, or I am, it's present tense, but it's future because you're saying the next. I am running this company. Or if you want your health, um, when I came, I was actually very unhealthy when I arrived in Benares in July, and one of the reasons I chose Benares is because New York, Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta are such fast cities that I could not get myself into that mode, and I knew no one in Benares. So I figured it's very easy to come here and just be more um, still. And I just really, really, you know, I wanted to practice a lot of these things that I'm teaching to everyone. And I just came here and I started out clean, new, new flat, started out everything fresh, and just spent my time with these affirmations, all the lessons that I've, that I've been teaching, right? And I said, I am losing weight. But then I thought, oh, you can lose weight and be very healthy, right? Uh, unhealthy, right? You could get like dengue fever or something and, and lose a lot of weight. I don't want that. Okay, you have to be careful what you say. So I said, I am a healthy, dynamic woman. Healthy is the swast, and dynamic means I can still move around. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to lose 50 kgs or I'm going to, you know, have uh, clean skin. It means I'm going to be healthy, whatever that looks like, right? I am a healthy, dynamic woman. I am a healthy, dynamic woman. And these kind of affirmations that you can learn how to write the proper affirmations are extremely powerful for the management um, sector. And I think you have to work on your own person, personally. Once you do that, then you move into, you know, like I had last year I was saying, I am receiving the Fulbright Award. I am receiving the Fulbright Award. I am receiving the Fulbright to India. I am going to India for a Fulbright. And I just keep saying it every day, every day, every day. The chances of me getting a Fulbright, by the way, were very, very low because it's a very competitive program. I'll shift over and, um, see this that Oh, I'll shift over and, and talk about Fulbright for a couple of minutes. So Fulbright is a, um, a program that basically rewards people for being great. And they have a lot of money that was set up in the 1940s by a senator named Senator Fulbright. And he decided that to have international exchange between people of the USA and other countries would be very good for the world. Because around that time, as you know, the United Nations was forming and there was a lot of work going on between international corporations in different parts of the world post World War II. So the program with India started and is one of the biggest programs at Fulbright because the Peace Corps as, as you guys know what the Peace Corps is, that is not allowed in India because of some difficulties between President Nixon and Indira Gandhi. So they needed something um, that would be an exchange program and they decided to make the Fulbright Nehru uh, program a big program. So a lot of people come to India, it's 50 people that come and it's 50 people that go from India to the US. They get, I don't, they never tell you exactly how many, but I've heard that it's tens of thousands of applications every year. 
So it's very competitive. And they've never given a Fulbright. It's only about 20% that go to the science, the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. It's called STEM. Uh, and mathematics and medicine, those are the two M's. So first of all, I was in the 20%. Then 80% is either business or social science or arts. And they will take people from institutions in India who have demonstrated work that they are doing and send them to, from India to America, from America to India. And they will ask you for a few things um, in order to have a successful application. So of course I looked into how to do it. I had a couple of people help me, but this is what I've learned. If you're going from India, it's very competitive. So you have to have someone in the US that will be willing to sponsor you. So you should have some contacts and they should write you a nice letter. Maybe having seen someone at a conference here, maybe um, having attended something. Um, you know, just having correspondence is possibly okay, but usually not enough because a lot of people can just get a letter from someone. But from someone in the US saying, we'd love to have this person as an expert in X field to come and do Y project specifically, that's what they're looking for. The biggest thing that will help you get a Fulbright is to have a specific project that you want to do and a timeline to do it in, and then the SMART. You guys know what SMART goals are, right? S is sustainable, M is measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Those are the SMART goals. So you make sure that your project demonstrates those five things, and you write something that you want to do uh, to someone in the US, and then have them agree that they would host you. Host means just the, the uh, <coughs> logistical part of it, because the money is all given by Fulbright. Okay. There are several people that go from management fields every year from India to the US, usually to exchange um, projects that we've done here that are very successful, like um, you know the Tiffin system in Bombay that's been a write-up in the Harvard Business Review, I don't know that. Or the dobies that wash clothes that never mark the clothes, but somehow they know whose is whose and where each one comes from. So these kind of management, you know, organizing, are very, very important. Um, water management, a lot of things in the environment, public health. These are things that they're looking for, and education. So if you have good education models for management, those are very, very useful. India is because of the volume that we have to uh, work with of people and of resources. We have an ability that um, a lot of Americans just don't have. And so they're very curious, how do you scale up? How do you take something on a larger scale? Uh, we also have IT. I, I don't know if we really have IT because I don't see a lot of people as competent as, and, but some of the best people in IT are in India. And I uh, think that there are specific projects that you could do. If you put together a project that's specific and then you apply, you also need three letters of recommendation um, and they should be really good letters. Now, um, I shouldn't probably say this, but I will. From the time that you're in college, usually what happens is you end up drafting the letter of your recommendations. That's the honest to God truth. If you don't know it already, I'll just <coughs> put it to you. Um, I write letters for my students, but I ask them, tell me the bullet points you want me to put in the recommendation. And the students will tell me. It gives me an assessment of how they're writing about themselves, how they think of themselves, how good their English is. It tells me a lot. So if a student says, Dr. Bhattacharya, please write me a letter of recommendation, I say, you give me the bullet points of what you want me to include. Huh. That's, and I tend to write my own letters. Most of the people that write letters say, I don't have time, weeks go by, months go by, the student's waiting. And so the thing that ends up happening is the student drafts a letter. The teacher or the recommender looks at the letter, revises it, adds something, subtracts something, and sends it out. And so, is it true that I wrote most of my recommendations? Yeah, it's true. Is it true that I authored them? No, because the people that actually looked at them signed their name to it and agreed to everything that I wrote. But you have to make those letters look very good, one. And nobody will say this out loud, right? You know, what I just said is a forbidden truth that nobody ever uh, actually says it. But it's the truth. You know, if you want anything to get done in management, of anything, whether it's your Fulbright application or a project, you have to draft it and put it in front of the SIR that's going to give the approval because usually that SIR has so much work to do. Uh, so you need that. 
you need to have a very good state of the art essay on the field that you're going in. So it's management, you should write about the challenges of whatever your project is on. Uh, you have to have a bibliography of the latest resources so they want to see whether or not you're actually an expert in your field. You have to have that letter of sponsorship from the US and then it's a 45 page application. So uh, you start it, you do one or two pages you know, in the evening, one night, over a cup of tea, and then you save the application, you come back the next week and you do a few more pages. And if you start early, then 45 pages, just get it done. And um, it, it's mostly demographic information or questions to ask and answer. Um, and then you have your essays and things. If you apply, I will tell you that the best part of applying is the discipline that you learn. And once you've done a few of these applications, you get so good at it that writing grants, writing applications will become a skill set for you. And gaining skill sets, I think, is one of the biggest um, advantages that you can have in the management field. Because generally, we outsource all kinds of uh, work that we need to get done. If you know how to do the work because you have the skill set, you will gain much more. So I have gained web, you know, like I can build my own website, I can uh, type my own letters, I know how to do, I know how to iron my own clothes, I know how to, you know, create documents like this, I know how to lay things out, I know how to publish. Will I do everything at once? No, because I can, I don't have that much time in the day. But to know how to do it, to gain the skill sets is very important. So if you know how to write these applications, then you can get one of your juniors to help you on it, but you should know. And I would highly recommend that you take either the full ride or some kind of uh, grant application from, you know, there's all kinds of management institutes of government of India funding, and um, just apply for something just to get that experience. Okay, um, I did my project on OGIS, which is vitality, and what I have learned is that everyone knows what OGIS is, which is vitality and well-being, but nobody knows what it is. And so what I'm doing is looking in the Shastras from the Rig Veda all the way down to the Ayurveda books. And I'm analyzing um, how that is and how it applies to immunity. And what I found is that modern day living does not actually support Ojas. Most of you are not at your optimal best. So what I will leave you with is that if you can consider where you can as a person take care of yourself better, and take some of the lessons maybe that you've learned in your days before now, or maybe something I mentioned today, and um, incorporate those into your life. Use that as your foundation, and then go and do whatever you want in management, whether it's running a company, or event management, or directing an academic uh, um, section of a, of a university. Um, I hope this has been somewhat useful for you and that you found something in here that's a, a pearl among the other things which possibly you already knew. But if we have time, I'll just take a couple of questions. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I'd just like to ask just one question. Whatever you said just now, uh, it reflects a lot about the course uh, mindfulness that we run. Like, for example, uh, we tell our students sometimes that find 10 minutes of time every day when you just do nothing, right? Just sit down and just do nothing for 10 minutes. And there are students who come and they say they have their own experiences because, as you said, chanchal is a wandering mind and they have a lot of different kinds of thoughts. Another thing which you're talking about, you're talking about having creative ideas when you're taking a shower. <coughs> That's also something which uh, mindfulness uh, talks about like for example you go to bathing and you just be mindful that you we, we say it in a way like think yourself to be the Rudra uh, to be the yeah. Shiva living Shiva and you are having the Abhishek when you are getting inside the shower and of course it's so there's a lot of uh, commonality between uh, what you spoke just now about Ayurveda and what it's already been taught in mindfulness. Uh, Absolutely. Most of what I've said has already been taught. If any of you have read Dinacharya uh, texts or articles in magazines, it's already been taught. The question is, why don't we do it? I can guarantee that everyone in this room has some space left, that no one's at 100%. There's something that we could be doing a little bit better. Why aren't we doing it? 
Do we not have respect for our bodies? Do we not have respect for our minds? What is it that we're missing? What is it that we do too much of or too little of? And that's the question. Once we get to that, that's what human potential is. That's what the enlightenment is. When we get to that place and we have light going through our bodies, right? I mean, if you've ever woken up and you look in the mirror and there's a light shining from your body, there's a glow shining from your body, that's what ojas is. It's a wonderful feeling. You just look at yourself and or people will tell you there's this amazing <laughs> glow about you. It's a wonderful feeling. So what is it that keeps us from wanting that in our lives? I think one of the reasons is that whenever you uh, say to someone that you should do it, it's coming from someone and they said, uh, maybe he's saying it, but why should I listen to him? But of course if it comes from someone who is like a Steve Jobs or who is from some so-and-so place and so-and-so corporation, and he's, say for example, is today Google is running mindfulness, Yesterday, it's, it's a 2,000, 3,000 years old tradition, so it already existed. But people never uh, talked about it. Uh, people have always been talking about it, but people were ne never uh, willing to listen to it. And yet they are what Google said. It. <laughs> yes. So that is called Akta Upadesha in uh, Sanskrit. It means uh, you listen to your elders, or you listen to someone who you think is an authority figure. If they say it, if Steve Jobs says it, Google says it, if uh, someone you respect says it, you know, Abdul Kalam says it, or so, I don't know, someone you really look up to, Dr. Cha says it, then you will say, oh, okay, he's saying it, he has the experience. So now, Director Saab is saying it, I will do it. He must know why, because he's an authority on that. That's called Abdul Pilesha. People, when we are arrogant, I was arrogant when I was younger. Um, I suppose in some ways I still am. And we believe in pratyaksha, our own direct experience. This is the experience of my life. Don't tell me what your life is. This is my life. Your lessons are for your life. These are my lessons for my life. And that arrogance keeps us from being able to learn from others. So if we can just listen to what someone says and say, OK, let me see if there's any wisdom in here for me. Let me see if I can accept something in here. And maybe at most of it's pakwas. I don't want to listen to most of it. But let's see if there's something in here then that's there. I think most of what you're teaching in mindfulness courses, um, whether it's in the management school or in a medical school or in a public health school or in a music school, you know, the music gurus um, try to teach that to their students. And most of the musicians that I know that are A-class musicians are alcoholics. They're womanizers or manizers. They are addicted to bond. They're addicted to, oh God, that they smoke. They, they have all these huge addictions, and I just wonder, you know, I just wonder why, and I see them, and I, I hang out with a lot of musicians uh, socially, and I just see them, and my mother always minded it because she thought I would kind of fall down that slippery slope and become, you know, like that. Um, it's made me more clear that I don't, and I actually don't smoke, and I don't, you know, I don't do all that stuff. I've never touched marijuana, heroin, cocaine, any of that stuff, which is very popular in the U.S., and I know how to drink because we were taught how to drink in medical school. We had after class, they passed around glasses and they said, if you're going to be a sophisticated member of society, you better not get drunk. You should learn how to drink. So they showed us how to pour wine. You don't pour it to the top, you pour it this much. How to sniff it, how to get the bouquet, how to look for the leggings in the glass, and all the lessons of how to drink wine, how to drink uh, hard liquor. So we learned how to do it. I called my mom, mom, guess what I'm learning in school? Uh, but I don't get addicted to those things. And yet, why do they get addicted? I think it's because they capitalize their senses. That's where their music comes from. You know, to be completely indulgent and uh, just uh, over the top with their emotions. That's how they express the ragas in their music. And so once they go over the top, they lose control. To go over the top and know that you're doing that, you're completely involved in Maya and Leela, but then to have a thread that will bring you back in to that core, that's what's missing in most of the people. And I think in management, you will have intense days where you'll work 18, 20 hours per day, 
But to not lose yourself is the key. To not get into that binge of, okay, I gotta stay up late. I'm gonna have more coffee. I'm gonna have more this, more this. I'm gonna survive this, this you know, crisis. And then once it's over, you just lose yourself. I think that's where people get lost. And um, in my experience, um, this mindfulness training has to be there, not when the times are easy. And not, actually, it has to be there when the times are easy to learn, because when the times are tough, it has to be there as a second nature. And I find that we teach a lot of this stuff, but people don't use it when times get tough. They'll just they'll go back to the shortcuts of what they know. So, any other questions? Does that, I don't know if that answers your issue or what you were discussing. Yes, yes. Okay. Any other questions? Issues you want to discuss? This is India, nobody ever speaks up. <laughs> Nothing? Do you guys just all want to leave right now? It's 5.45. You want to get home to your families. <laughs> Nothing else? Okay, then I'll say thank you. for uh, showering those words. Now I would like to request our, uh, our the Dean of uh, Development uh, and uh, uh, Center for Spiritualism, uh, Mr. Sandeep Singh, to come and give a word of thanks. And I must say that uh, you picked some of our weak points and uh, very delicately you uh, raised the issues and we all realize that all the problem lies within us. We are not ready to rectify it ourselves but we look for blaming others for our problems. So what you said is a perfect thing. That <coughs> discipline is something which is required. And I think Patanjali, his first two step of Ashtanga Yoga, which are Yam and Niyam, and uh, we think of achieving Moksha, but we, at the first lesson of Yam and Niyam, we are failures. So how to get that and uh, very, and I, I must tell you, we, we will call you again because you only told 15 points. You told I think 42 points are there. I didn't want to bore you. <laughs> no. <clears throat> and people but, were going like this when I was saying, scrape your tongue. No, 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 no. <laughs> so I know everyone's not doing it. So, so we, ma'am, we were thinking actually. Huh? <laughs> we were thinking over whatsoever you have said. Which ones you also yeah, yeah. feel yourself up. So early morning, 4.30, Brahmurat. So I think this is the first lesson what is there for them, for all of us, which is going to come after a few hours. So. <laughs> 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 this one do it right away. Honestly, you can't do it right yes, away. If you do yes. it right away, you'll get sick. You have to go back every day waking up 10 minutes earlier earlier. So if you wake up at 8 now, mm -hmm. tomorrow wake up at 7.30, okay. then 7.40. Every few days, just move it back. Don't do it suddenly. Sudden changes are always sudden begin, sudden end. Huh. Slow changes, gradual changes are last. So, I must thank you. And uh, our students were not here. And I think they would also have been a uh, beneficiary of this. So, First of all, I would like to take promise from you that you will again come. And I will also say a few words to our students also. And all 42 points, you are only restricted to the morning schedule. But till sleep. Actually, I have a book coming out, which I didn't mention. It's 
my first book. It's through Random House, uh, the publisher. And uh, my editor just called me today. They're in the process of editing it. And it will describe the 42 steps and how to practically put it into your life. Okay, so that should be out, I think, March or April on the stores. Maybe we can coordinate something to bring that <coughs> No, but I think the book cannot be a replacement for you. I'm not saying as a replacement. I'm saying... Uh, we will have to go, but would like to have launch. you personally. No, no, book launch includes me. And then, <laughs> why not? So, thank you, ma'am, for coming here. And thank you, Vajpayee, sir, okay. for this opportunity. If it weren't for his arm, it wouldn't have happened. So, I'll bring another one. Maybe I get that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's actually it's amazing. Both of us felt the cold, and he called me the next morning and said the most amazing thing happened. I slept all night and I've been in pain for the last I think it was at that point three weeks. Yeah, he had not slept, and I never slept till that day. I was actually just used to reclining. Sit, on the, yeah, sitting. Yeah, sitting like so uh, it's been it's been actually very good. But as you you know him better than I. He apparently took off the sling and started overusing the arm and got it, I detect that it's re-injured because he's not uh, being gentle to it. I so started I driving with one hand, I was driving with one hand. He was driving. What, in Banaras driving with the, moving the gears? No, in Banaras, in Banaras driving with two hands is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, having this kind of uh, interaction with him, but yeah, I think I didn't tell you about the side of my life where I learned energy work. I lived in Tibet for six months and I learned how to do energy work and looking at uh, spiritual and human potential that way. And there's a heat that comes from my hands that I've learned to explore uh, what it does. It's quite fascinating. I, I don't exactly know what it is. It's supernatural, but it, it, it does stuff like this. It's just kind of cool. That is pranic healing. It's, it's, yeah, people will call it Reiki, Pranic healing, yeah. things like this. They he actually can see it because he was watching my hands when I was talking. So, uh, and I think there are a couple of people that can actually see the energy in my hands. I can detect the people around the world. Actually, the energy thing goes very well in the West because they can relate to the equation which exists about energy. So, whenever you talk something on energy or consciousness, Something which is more empirical, something which is more rational, so they understand it very well. But I think Indians do it, but we just don't yes, talk they, about it. They don't do it now. They, they have been doing it for 3,000 years, I guess. That's right. Like that. And Indians are funny in that we don't talk about those things which are really essential. We don't. And if one thing I've learned being in UP, most people in UP lie like I've never seen them. <laughs> you guys lie with a straight face. <laughs> You have what in America is called poker faces. You know what's a poker face? It is part of being a UP man. There's only one other woman in the room. I have never, I was just marveling today that UP men know how to lie because it's part of your culture that I will do what I want to do. Society will not approve of it. And so I have to learn how to say it. And you can just say just clearly. That lie it may be clever. But I will tell you, it's taking away from your personal power. It's taking away from your personal power. Because when you have to say, I'm in a meeting, when you're actually with your mistress. Ah, yes, it is a meeting, that's a true.